Over a century ago, a tomb ship bound for China is shipwrecked and sinks. The SS Ventnor has a ghostly cargo. The remains of 499 Chinese gold miners, all packed in coffins that never made it home. The ship still lies at the bottom of the ocean, somewhere off the coast of northern New Zealand. The ship's manifest goes down with the coffins, so the names of the miners are erased from history along with their bones. But the name of one man has been preserved. Choi Su Hoi. And it still calls to his family through time. He is buried at the moment uh, in, a, in a watery grave and from Chinese superstition, that's not good. Choi Siu Hoi uh, was my great grandfather, and this is my greatest wish that I could be able to do something to complete his journey home. Choi Su Hoi was one of the first and greatest Chinese pioneers in New Zealand, and his name holds a rightful place among the founding fathers of modern New Zealand. Choi's remains were in one of the 499 coffins lost when the Ventnor sank of Hokianga on that fateful night more than a century ago. This is the journey of his modern-day Kiwi descendants to find a home for Choi Su Hoi's spirit and possibly his body. Eighteen sixty one, and the rush is on. Gold has been discovered in Otago's Gabriel's Gully, spurring a frenzy of gold fever felt the world over. Miners rush from Australia, the US, and Europe. But the Otago gold rush was over almost as soon as it had started. The quick men who came in search of easy riches fled. At the end of that time, between 1861 and 1864, the gold rush had seen the departure of thousands of European miners, either going back to Victoria or going off to the West Coast gold rushes. And the population went down so quickly from about 19,000 European miners in early 1864 to 6,000 in late 1865. What New Zealand needed was a new group of men willing to work harder for their riches. The invitation went out from the Otago Provincial Council for Chinese gold miners to come to New Zealand to work the available gold fields. One local who was attracted was a 30-year-old merchant, Choi Su Hoi. Choi Su Hoi came from Ponyu in Guangdong province, and it turned out that the earliest Chinese arrivals to Otago came from the upper Ponyu. They had uh, taken part in the Red Turban Rebellion. Their part of the county was devastated by the uh, government revenge. So it was in a disturbed state and in a poor state, and they had to flee. And he came along with that first group, and they saw an opportunity in Otago. When Choi Su Hoi arrived in Dunedin, the merchant in him immediately saw opportunity. He set up a general store in Stafford Street, Dunedin, to provide for the Chinese mining community. They would come off the boat, and make for his store, which was in Lower Stafford Street, uh, just opposite the um, Rattray Street Wharf. He provided the Chinese provision, the gold mining equipments, like the gold panning and, and diggers and so on. Choi Su Hoi's store became a mecca for the Chinese miners in Otago. 
he wasn't actually a gold miner himself, he was a businessman, he was a merchant, and he actually supplied the gold miners and um, uh, helped them with a lot of their affairs. Um, and how he did that was, he was probably a lot smarter, but he knew English. And that was his key to uh, being able to, to do business, um, uh, also to translate for the, for the gold miners um, and do all those sorts of affairs. Equally, if not um, of prime importance, was that he had the resources to give uh, miners equipment and food to tide them over their initial uh, uh, state before they were earning well. And he would receive them, give them advice, break them into parties, give them initial clothing and get them away in there. It was into forbidding hills like these in the Kawaro Gorge, more than 200 kilometers inland from Dunedin, that the Chinese miners had to trek, often on foot, to search for gold. Duncan Su Hoi and his son Peter are retracing their steps. They're heading for one of the old camps in the Kawaro Gorge to discover just how tough life was for the Chinese miners as they dug for gold in this remote hinterland. Historian Les Wong is an expert on the Chinese miners' experience in New Zealand. Hello, Les. How are you? The miners built their huts out of schist rocks that they found in the riverbeds. They brought the rocks up from the river. After the gold had been washed, the rocks were clean and they put it together. Often when goods came from the Dunedin, they were wrapped in sacking from the Suhoi stores. So that sacking was then reused again for insulation on the huts. It's a good idea. What other supplies would the gold miners have got from him? They brought uh, mainly dried foods. Uh, there was Chinese food like rice, uh, dried fish, uh, dried plums, ginger, and there was even uh, liniment and ointment that they could use when they got hurt. But other than that, there was no medical service and only herbs that they could use to ease their pain from the hardship that they had on the gold fields. It would take two weeks for the Suhoi's horse and cart to get up here from Dunedin with supplies. And for those Chinese miners who had to trek here on foot, it would take a month of hard walking. It was back-breaking work getting at the gold, shoveling sand into sluices, separating the tiny grains of gold embedded in the quartz rocks. It wasn't only the work itself that was challenging. The central Otago climate was unforgiving. In summer, they could be cooking out here alive in 36 degree heat. And in winter, the opposite extreme, with temperatures dropping to as low as 20 below. Sickness was a constant companion. Those who were so sick got left behind as the others moved on, because taking them with them would have been a burden and they starved to death and died a very lonely death. Despite the hardships on the gold fields, nobody prospered as much as the men who supplied the miners. Hoi Seo Hoi was a top merchant in Dunedin, acknowledged by Europeans and Chinese alike. <laughs> when they reacted against the Chinese later on, they were called uh, Celestials and Mongolians and that kind of name, but it was always Mr. Silhoi. <laughs> he married a European woman, Eliza Prescott, and had two children with her. He also invested in gold mining, buying and operating two gold dredges. Choi Silhoi had about a dozen mining ventures, and he had two uh, quartz mines, for example. Then he had sluicing ventures, of which the one at uh, Nakamai was a top public company in New Zealand for sluicing for several years. Off the back of the gold miners and the mechanization that Choi Su Hoi introduced, 
Dunedin grew to become one of the wealthiest cities in the Southern Hemisphere. The grand buildings that line its streets today are all in part the result of Choi Su Hoi's business acumen and vision. He, uh, of all people, would have been the closest Chinese person in Otago to joining the European elite. Generosity and tradition was at the heart of Choi Su Hoi's business model. In 1882, as the leader of the Chinese community in Otago, he founded a charitable society, the Chong Sing Tong, to assist the gold miners with their spiritual needs. Really, it was an insurance policy for the Chinese gold miners. Should they pass away in New Zealand, then there was money available for their uh, remains to be exhumed, for the remains to be shipped back to China and reburied in their home villages. Duncan Su Hoi still has some of the original society donation letters sent by gold miners to his great grandfather's store. This is a letter dated the uh, 19th of July, 1882, sent in by one of the Chinese gold miners uh, from Central Otago, Lawrence, to Su Hoi, enclosing seven pound 50 cents. This is another letter sent to Xiu Hoi in 1882. In the letter, there is three pounds sent into the Xiong Xin Tong, Benevolent Society, and from the miner called Yip Man, and this came from Central Otago, a uh, mining area. In 1883, the society successfully arranged for the shipment of 230 bodies from New Zealand back to China. In 1901, Choi Su Hoi began arranging for a second shipment of Chinese miners' bodies back to their homeland. Some of the Chinese graves dug up were from here, in Dunedin's southern cemetery. There were over 40 cemeteries right throughout the country where they were exhumed from. The bulk of them were run the Otago and West Coast area. They began exhumations in early 1901 and they concluded towards the end of 1902. The Europeans at the time must have been horrified to, to hear of what the Chinese wanted to do, to, to dig up the remains of their fellow countrymen and take them back to China to get reburied. How did they get permission to do that? Everybody in New Zealand knew about it and they just did not like it. They were horrified. They were petitioning against the Chinese carrying out this practice. But the health department said that they had issued a permit for the Chinese to go ahead and do this particular task. I heard from my family mentioned that the bodies from the place around here were sent into my great, great grandfather Choi Su Hoi's farm in Kaiko Valley. Yes, your father's quite right. It was a very unpleasant process. Their bones were individually washed, and each bone was counted, and the small bones were put into individual wrappings of calico. The bigger bones were put into a larger calico bag, and they were all put together. And from that, they actually put the name of the person inside the bag, and the bag was tied. Then the bag was put into a coffin and they were stacked in the sheds and they were stored there until all the coffins were ready to be shipped. Digging up the bodies for the second shipment was disrupted when Choi Su Hoi died suddenly in July 1901, just a year before the second shipment was due to set sail back to China. As a respected city leader, Choi Su Hoi was given a prominent burial here in Dunedin's Southern Cemetery. His death was a major setback for the Chong Sing Tong Society's body repatriation plans, into which stepped his son, Choi Kum Poi, who took over running both the society and the shipment. The SS Ventnor, with its cargo of 499 coffins, set to sea from Wellington bound for Hong Kong on the 26th of October, 1902. 
Choi Su Hoi's body now was also part of the cargo. Most of the coffins were stowed below. The ship was refitted to take those Chinese coffins together with the Chinese who were supervising the voyage as well. So there were live Chinese accompanying their ancestors back to China. The Chinese remains on their last great journey home were never to make it. ship struck rocks on the west coast of the North Island of New Zealand, approximately halfway up the island. The ship was far too close to the coast. The sea conditions were good, and the coast was pretty well lit. It shouldn't have happened. The captain reversed the vessel and got off the rocks, but instead of limping to the nearby port of New Plymouth, he made a fateful decision the captain decided that the damage wasn't as severe as they thought, and they thought they could actually make it up to Auckland. But unfortunately, the damage was severe, and they took on water, and the boat sank off the Hokianga heads. I believe it's 10 miles out in, I think, 150 metres of water, so it's uh, in a very, very deep, deep place. Four hundred and ninety-nine coffins sank to the ocean floor, a tragedy of such immensity and consequence that an official board of inquiry was convened. Three boats got off the Ventnor safely with most of the crew and passengers. The fourth did not. No one survived from that boat. That was the one with the master. So he was carrying on the traditions of the British Merchant Marine by being one of the last off the ship itself. Thirteen men perished when the Ventnor sank, including five elderly Chinese attendants who had been given free passage home by the Chongqing Tong Society in exchange for looking after the coffins on board. The official court of inquiry was clearly a little bit frustrated. It identified the main cause, which was very obvious, navigational error, incompetence. There was some debate about whether booze had contributed to that. The officers stood by the mast and said, no, 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 no sign of drinking. Many, but not all of the crew said, yes, he was known to take a drop. We could smell it on him. He was red-faced on the day. So they probably decided seeing he was dead in the, you know, the way of the day, not to cancel his certificate and keep his name clear. The Chinese community in New Zealand were devastated by the Ventnor's sinking. It was especially harrowing news for Dunedin restaurateur Duncan Su Hoi's family at the time. They'd lost their elder Choi Su Hoi, whose coffin had gone down with the ship. For our family, that was really sad. And then my grand-uncle chartered uh, vessels to come here to look for the body, look for the coffins. Choi's son, Kum Poi, immediately initiated a search for the stricken vessel. When he heard of the Vietnam sinking, my great-uncle was obviously devastated. The society immediately uh, chartered another boat, I think it's called the uh, steamer called Energy, to come down to this area and search for any remains or any of the coffins um, that may be floating. My great uncle was crying, saying, my poor father died twice. It was, in a sense, a, a second death for these people. Uh, the Chinese believe that uh, human remains should be buried. A watery death or submergence is a second death. The sinking of the Ventnor still resonates with the Su Hoi family today. They had lost their family leader for good to the sea, and his watery grave was a doubly bad resting place in Chinese belief systems. Here in Dunedin's Chinese gardens, 
a memorial to the Chinese gold miner's contribution to the early history of Otago. Duncan and Peter Suhoi know just how important it is spiritually to the Chinese that their dead be buried back in their homeland. This is especially important for the Chinese as the living descendants can tend to the graves of their descendants to ensure uh, a good afterlife for the deceased, but also um, ensure um, success for the living descendants. The wreck of the SS Ventnor has never been officially located. It still lies in this watery grave, thought to be 10 miles off Hokianga Harbour in 160 metres of water one of the deepest wrecks in New Zealand's maritime history. In the months after the Ventnor sank in October 1902, a bag containing several bones washed ashore at Mitimiti, north of Hokianga Harbour. Peter's taking the four and a half hours drive north from Auckland to discover what happened to those remains that washed up on the land of the Te Rarawa tribe. I'm off to meet one of the elders, Mingo. He's going to tell me the story of what his, uh, what his ancestors did when they discovered the bones and buried the bones. Uh, I'm really excited to, to hear his stories. Peter is given a traditional welcome onto the marae at Mitimiti to meet tribal elder Mingo Martin. Uncle Mingo, thank you for welcoming me back onto your marae. You're all right. Can I just ask you? Just a few questions about the, the, the vent noir that sunk and the bones that washed up onto your beaches. C can, you, can you tell me how they were found and what happened to the bones? There was no roads in those, those days and, and the beach was the main highway. And of course they used to pick up from about five k's down the, down the beach there, pick up all the cream. They would bring all the cream cans down to the beach and. This particular morning, he, they were going up, picking up their cans, and th they found these uh, bags on the beach. Uh, so he picked one up, opened it, had a look in it, and, and saw it was just bones. So he had no uh, idea what, you know, what was going on, where, where these bones came from. So they buried them in the cemetery in, in Rawane, which was not a Māori cemetery, but a Pākehā cemetery. One very, very good thing that's come out of it, it's brought the, the local Māori, yeah. who've found the bones and the Chinese together. We respect you as people. We respect your culture, we respect your custom. It doesn't matter uh, who they are, what colour they were. Uh, a person who's deceased is a person who's deceased, and they always respected the deceased. But uh, we have a saying, you know, uh, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. It is a person, it is a person, it is a person. We are like Chinese. I mean, we, we have this copa, as you call it. When our dead die, we assume, like the Chinese, if you don't go back to China, you, you know, your spirit doesn't reach Te Ida Wairua, which is the spiritual world. That a small number of the miners have a final resting place on dry land and are respected in a similar way by the Maori people is heartening to the Suhoi family. But with his curiosity fired up, Peter learns that remains floated ashore months later south of Hokianga Harbour in the lands of the Te Rorua tribe. One of my elders made me aware of the existence of some burials in the sand hills here of the remains of Chinese gold miners. The general locale is known, but not the precise 
site or the precise position where the interments occurred. But the documented record states that there were 33 coffins washed up here. The local iwi, or my family basically, would have been very surprised to find those things on the beach. They would have very quickly undergone some sort of uh, ritual process and um, interred them where they washed up. They would have had no idea where they had come from, and so the thing would have been to bury them quickly. What is remarkable is that the Teroroa people took it upon themselves to bury strangers not of their tribe on their own sacred land. They would have been obligated to deal with the remains in the way, in the fashion that they would, were accustomed to. That would be being respectful. The whole uh, process of reinterring them, I think, was I would have thought common to humanity, not just Māori or our people. A hundred and eleven years after the tragic sinking of the Ventnor, the Te Rorua tribe invite more than a hundred members of the Chinese community onto their marae to honour their ancestors' passing. As rain begins to gently fall, 36 members of the Suhoi family are present for this special day of commemoration, some of them pilgrims from as far afield as Hong Kong and Australia. Welcome, everybody, into our beautiful marae that God has, has made for us today. We have our wairua, the spirit of our ancestors and your ancestors. They're all up there. They're all looking down and they're probably saying, it's about time you fellas turned up, it's been over 100 years. <laughs> and for the one day that we could have picked to come here and do this special commemoration to those people who were tragically lost to us out here in the ocean, we couldn't have picked a better day. Here they are crying on us. I know you believe that too, that these are the tears of our ancestors that are raining down on us now. And of course, your culture, exactly, exactly the same as ours, wants to repatriate them back home. We call it the Ukaipo, where they were actually born. And um, we wanted to take them back home, just like you people were. I think most of us, most of the Chinese people are here today to extend their thanks to our cousins. By cousins, I mean the local Maori people. After the tragedy of the SS Ventana, some bones of the uh, 499 bodies were washed up shore, and the local Maori people find them and bury them here. I sincerely thank the Maori people, our cousins, for the noble deeds in helping the Chinese community. It was just such an emotional experience for us to be up here to speak to the descendants of the Maori that actually buried the remains and uh, have cared for the remains all these years. I could see that it was a relief for them to see us and uh, they didn't make mention of why did it take so long. <laughs> oh, tremendous. I feel very feel, feel emotional, excited, and felt the warmth and generosity from the tribes. We have three generations here with me to pay respect to my great grandfather. And somewhere I think he would probably feel very uh, humble and very honored or very pleased uh, that we are here, able to be here together. We chose this time because it's the, the Qingming Festival. Uh, the Qingming Festival is also called Ancestors' Day or Tomb Sweeping Day. 
It's a day where families get together and come to the grave sites uh, and the cemeteries to clean the, the stones and the sites, but mainly to um, spend time and pay respects to the ancestors. With Choi Su Hoi, it's the first Qingming ever that the family have been able to come to where Choi Su Hoi actually lies. They bring offerings, they bring food, chicken, pork buns, Chinese tea and wine to offer it to their, to their ancestors. They also offer money, they burn money so that their ancestors can have these up there in heaven. So that ensures a good afterlife for our ancestors and in turn prosperity for their living descendants. They want us back every year anyway to celebrate Qingming and they're very happy to see us because it's important uh, for them to tend to their deceased just as it is important for us. The Chinese visitors unveiled a plaque in a forest grove on the Marae to thank the Terorua tribe for respecting and caring for their ancestors' remains. This is just another step for relationships between our Māori people and the Chinese people. It's taken over 100 years, but it's been done. They weren't forgotten, and uh, you can imagine yourself, even in, in the human form, when things have been put right and done in that proper way, you too will shed tears, you know. Can't help it. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's huge. The spiritual side is huge in a, in a thing like this. With the knowledge that some of their countrymen made it ashore and have found a safe and caring resting place, Peter and Duncan Su Hoi now have a vision. Can the rest of the miners and their family patriarch, Choi Su Hoi, also be rescued and perhaps returned to China? Peter Su Hoi meets with the former Minister of Māori Affairs, Peter Sharples, and the Chinese consul in New Zealand, Niu Xingbao, to discuss the vent north sinking. And we have a saying, only when one is buried in the earth, he or she can rest in peace. Yeah, well, same. until he's buried, even though he's dead, he's like a, a, a ghost wandering around without home. A burial is his or her home That's forever. That's exactly the same as Māori. You know, <clears throat> always to, the other thing is to locate them in their own area. So when I die, my tribe will come and get me. Or will haunt them for a hundred years. I think with the Vietnam tragedy, it's the inability of the living descendants in China to actually have the remains go back and be buried so that they can um, worship their ancestors so that their, the, the ancestors can have a good afterlife and also bring good fortune to the living descendants. I think that's more with the, with the tragedy. Well, see, you've just described what it is like for Māori people who cannot get their, uh, their dead, if you like, back home and buried in the proper way, in the proper place. They feel exactly like that. Yes. Duncan Suhoi's dream is that the vent nor is located and salvaged so the Chinese remains can be returned home. I wish and uh, be part of my family honour to be able to uh, complete his journey home. The New Zealand Navy has offered the services of its dive ship, the HMNZ Manawanui, to dive for and locate the wreck of the SS Ventnor. It is standing by for suitable weather conditions to complete the mission. Until that day comes, Duncan Su Hoi, great grandson of Choi Su Hoi, has one other important journey to complete. 
He will close the circle and make the ancestral journey back to Guangzhou that Choi Su Hoi never got to complete. I'm really, really, very excited that I can start going back on the route and my wish was to complete the journey home. Now I am going that route. Finally, Duncan's off to China, heading for Guangzhou to commemorate with his Chinese relatives his revered ancestor's life. Wow, we finally arrived in China, in Guangzhou. Marvelous. He's taking with him his son Peter and daughter-in-law Janice to share the experience. Guangzhou today is a bustling, dynamic metropolis of almost 40 million people. Located on the Pearl River, 120 kilometers north of Hong Kong, Guangzhou is China's most populous city. When Duncan was born in the 1930s, Guangzhou's population was just a little over 200,000 people. A very different world. The changes in Guangzhou is massive. The economy is thriving. 30 years ago, the streets were full of bikes. Now, everyone has a car. It's incredible how the city and the people's lives have transformed and grown. Duncan emigrated to New Zealand when he was 12 years old in 1946. It's really important to me that I'm accompanying my father back to the village for the very first time to meet some of our family, but more importantly, pay respect to our ancestors. I can see huge changes since the 70 years when I first traveled along this narrow gravel road in 1944 under the Japanese occupation. There were rice and vegetable fields stretching far and wide on both sides of this road. Today, rice is still being harvested in the fields outside the village. The urban expansion is fast approaching. Now, in 2014, I see many large farming areas have disappeared to make room for bigger villages and townships. Buildings and bikes and cars are now everywhere, eating into the countryside. I miss the clean, fresh country air, the buffaloes working in the rice fields and the blue sky. The Su Hoys have arrived in their ancestral village of Sha Kung, the birthplace of Duncan's great grandfather, Choi Su Hoi. Children of the Su Hoi family all around this area. Duncan and his family's pilgrimage to their ancestral village is a time for reflection, but also one of celebration. Tonight, the Su Hoys are hosting a special dinner for over 200 of their relatives from the village to mark their return and to thank them all for their support over the years. It was a chance to pull out the family tree and to rejoice in their family connections. I had to use a family tree book to relate them to which generation and how we are related. And this is very exciting. All our members and families, they say, oh, I'm so-and-so. Some of them, I have to call you grand-uncle and call you now cousin and this and that.
was really delicious, especially the sickling piglets. It was good. Over 10 dishes, especially, make us very happy to see so many relatives that we have not even met before. And this is very exciting. And I'm really overwhelmed as well to see so many relatives that live in the village that I, I don't know. And if I've got so, an opportunity tonight, we'll go around and meet some more of them. Along with renewed connections, it's time to finally visit Choi Su Hoi's original village home. So generous. Yes. Money. That here we are, finally arriving at our great, great grandfather's house. And I really thought my dream is to become a tool. And this is the one that, that is, is the one that I've been, been great grandfather Su Hoi born here. I've been through here in my younger days, and this is it. I'm very emotional. OK, this is it. So we've got, we've got um, cousin Wayne and cousin Mike from yes. Bong Zhou yes. uh, to show us through the house. So I'm right. just going to knock on the door and right. we'll see if right. they're there. OK. okay. Thank you. Oh. Hi, Wayne. Oh, How are yeah. you? Oh, welcome, welcome. 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 Almost in tears. It's, it's finally come in now, and my dream is almost at the end now, realizing it. No, that's oh, beautiful. Right. You haven't been here. Let me show you the, your own home, okay? okay. Uh, and this house is uh, lived in by the Siu Hoi, Charles Siu Hoi, in the 1860s, yes. before he went to uh, Australia and New Zealand, picking yes. up gold. This part is lived by his family and also his first and second cousin living the other side. Yes. And inside, there's a um, sort of a lounge. You come in here. Okay, <laughs> this is the original house. Yes. Oh, is this the first? First, first, first house. The first house of Siu Hoi built. Yeah. Oh, so, so I think, uh, you know, this why it's so important, you know, for the family. Yeah. 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 Up there, you know, there's still st some of our ancestors, uh, ashes stored in the cabinet up there. So are there still some ashes in those three vases? Yeah, you can see that on the top, top uh, corner, and of course it is much higher. Coming into the Seal House house and seeing open the door that I was so emotional that I felt a taste of joy. I was really happy to show Peter and Janice. At last, I could see uh, my dream come true. The culmination of Duncan and his family's journey has dawned. More than 40 of their Chinese relatives have arrived at Choi Su Hoi's Chinese gravesite to honor him in a Bai San ceremony. For Duncan, Peter, and Janice, it is a momentous occasion. <laughs> Nice to see you all here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a long, long journey. We've been in Dunedin, we've been to Hokianga, and now here it's amazing to come here. I think he'd be so happy with all the offerings that we've given him and just us being here. Knowing that Choi Su Hoi's body was unlikely to ever return home, his Chinese relatives used a spiritual leader to lure his spirit into a funeral jar. That jar is buried here in his Chinese grave. After a century of worry, it may be that Choi Su Hoi's spirit has been at rest all along, safe in the care of his family. Great, great grandfather. I'm Peter, and this is my wife, Janice. We've flown thousands of miles from all the way from New Zealand to be here today. We pay honour to you, 
we're here to pay our respects to you. Thank you for coming to New Zealand all those years and years ago. Had you not come to New Zealand, I would not be here today. Rest in peace. Great Queen Dad, I am your great grandson, Duncan, from New Zealand. I am 80 years old now. This is my first time to come here to pay respect to you. Knowing that my dream to bring you home and your friend or friends home to China and to lay you here in peace forever. I feel so honoured, so proud, and so emotional. I can't hold back my tears of happiness. At last, Duncan's journey is over. He's returned to his great-grandfather's ancestral village and paid homage to the great man and his legacy. Duncan's ultimate wish is that one day he will stand here on the banks of the Pearl River in Guangzhou, along with 5,000 members of his extended family from all around the world, all dressed in white, and welcome home Choi Su Hoi's body to the land of his birth and lay him to rest forever. <laughs> Thank you.